So I am Professor Preeti Parikh. I'm the director of Bartlett School of Sustainable Construction. And it's lovely to see you all in the room, in person. I know during COVID, we've had a lot of online meetings and debates and discussions. But in person is always better. And some of you are our well-wishers and friends. In fact, most of you in the audience are familiar faces. But just to say, we are thrilled to be welcoming you at this point where Bartlett School of Sustainable Construction is world leading in construction and is housed in the Bartlett Faculty of Built Environment, which is um, one of the top faculties in built environment. So this lecture comes at a really important and right point in time for us. And as I said, uh, it's fabulous to see all of you in the room because as a school, we are external facing. We work closely with industry. We have a range of valuable partnerships which really steer us to be world leaders. I'm going to give an example of one such partnership, but there are numerous partnerships, and that's in relation to our new MBA program in major infrastructure delivery, where we have a high-level external advisory board, and I see some members blushing in the audience here, who've been co-developing the curriculum with us, so that um, we provide insights for industry in collaboration with industry. But for us, those partnerships is key, and I truly believe that good leadership is about partnership, inclusion, and collaboration. And hence, I'm really thrilled to welcome and introduce Professor Martina Human because she embodies all those qualities of quality, of partnership, of collaboration, of inclusion. She is our professorial lead on the MBA program, along with Giuliano Denico, who's in the audience, um, who's put in a huge amount of effort to get the program up running on the ground. And also Martina joined us from VU Vienna, where she's a professor of economics and business. And for those who are scholars in the project management field, will know that she's published extensively on topics such as project careers, stakeholder engagement, sustainability, project management. And Martina has, uh, for her research on human resource management, project-oriented organizations. She was recognized by the IPMA Research Award. And for those of you who publish in journals in the field, will also know that Martina is the editor-in-chief of the journal in your field, which is International Journal of Project Management. And she's also the founding editor-in-chief of Project Leadership in Society, which is an open access journal. And as I said, project leadership is a topic which is close to my heart as well, because good leadership on projects is truly, truly difficult. Martina has over 20 years of experience in research teaching consultancy, and she believes in co-creation between practitioners and scholars. She also has strong links with project management associations, IPMA, PMI, APM. She's also a board member of Netflix, which is a network of owner organizations to foster knowledge creation and exchange of managing large transportation infrastructure projects in Europe. Her strength lies in bridging people, issues, and organizations. And the topic that she brings to us today, today is very timely. It's about the power of projects. And believe me, I think we need to remind ourselves as a community in the sector of the power of projects, of what the impact could be of projects. So I'm really thrilled that she's going to showcase and remind us of that. On, on a more personal note, Martina, if I may, I'm really delighted that we could poach her and convince her to join our school from Vienna. We are absolutely thrilled and delighted that uh, we have you here. And we want to use this public lecture as an opportunity to introduce Martina as a professorial colleague of our UCL community. So welcome, Martina, the floor is yours. Yeah, I have been looking forward to this uh, event over the last weeks, and I'm very happy to be with you. I'm very happy that you dedicate the time, and uh, I see some old faces, and I also see a lot of new faces here, so I'm very happy that you made it, and uh, you're going to yeah, come with me on a journey about the power of projects, and I will take you from an individual perspective uh, to a project perspective to a company perspective and end up 
with a society perspective. Um, my background, uh, as you could hear, is very much uh, HR, yeah, coming from a people's perspective, and I think you will recognize it. So it's a time of major transitions, and we have a sustainability transition. We have the need to uh, integrate sustainability uh, in our work. We have the need to uh, get it done. And why I call it the power of projects is that I think that we have the projects as a vehicle, as an agent, yeah, to get this change going, yeah, to get this transition going. Uh, on the one hand, sustainability transition. On the other hand, we are also living in a world where we get everyday news about uh, a new chatbot or artificial intelligence application or technology application. And so we're also living in a world where we have a digital transformation going on. And this is also what projects uh, can help us with. So let's see if this now works. Yes. Um, especially in the UK context, uh, but not only here, worldwide, there's a lot of conversation and narratives about costs. Costs overrun, delays. There's a lot about negative uh, news about projects. <coughs> I would like you to invite you to a paradigm shift, yeah, and also see the more bright side of projects, uh, which is uh, bringing benefits and creating value. And this is what I'm standing for, yeah. So I'm not saying that we should overspend. Don't misunderstand me. I think we should be resourceful, but we should uh, also see what value or what benefits for stakeholders we can create. And at the end of the day, what value uh, comes with the projects. Over the last years, uh, I have looked into motivation of young project professionals and project professionals. And we came up with a model uh, you see here, uh, and uh, it's based on self-determination theory. And within this model, what you can see is that everybody of us has some basic needs. And one of the basic needs is relatedness. Another one is competence. In the core, there is autonomy. We want to have autonomy about our actions. And the fourth one we added was purpose. And the purpose is very important when we talk about projects because this is what I mean with creation. Yeah? And we, know, we need to know uh, what the purpose is when we're working on a project. So what I always tell my students to ask the project owner is, why do you want this project? Yeah? Not about the project objectives. They are nice, nice to know but it's more important to understand the reason behind the project. And when we relate that now to projects, I see three different spaces. The one is the social space. The other one is the learning space. And the third one is the creation space. So what I'm offering here is a different perception on projects. And this different perception helps us to also take a more leadership perspective. Helps us to, as a project leader and as many project leaders on a project, as I believe, and also on programs, to share and to design project leadership and the project spaces in a way that we can support uh, the project team or the project teams. So what I'm offering here is project as creation spaces. And I call it co-creation spaces because as you could see, it's about learning and it's also about relatedness. And kind of when we look into the more younger generation, we understand that they consider projects very often as a learning opportunity, and this is good. So we are doing also some research on understanding why projects are good learning opportunities, for instance, to learn leadership, yeah? to 
be able to lead a small project team, kind of a sub-team, and grow into uh, becoming a project director if we talk about the huge projects, the huge public projects you have, uh, you have going on. As an example, and uh, I take here the renovation of the Austrian parliament. I'm aware that there's also a potential renovation of uh, your parliament going on, or let's say discussions about it. And uh, I'm using uh, this case um, as uh, kind of uh, illustrating what I mean with co-creation in public projects. And you see, uh, in 2014, there was uh, the agreement between all parties that they want to renovate. Yeah? So it's kind of always the political uh, decision to do something and to do something together. And uh, we have a very old parliament uh, in Vienna, and uh, everybody who has been there, uh, you know, uh, it was always standing there, but it was closed for the public. Yeah? So with that renovation, they also opened up for everybody. And this is a very, very nice benefit. Yeah? So it's not only kind of about the renovation of this building, but the benefits for the society and the value it was creating is a contribution to the democracy. Yeah? So what they have built in is uh, kind of they opened the library, they built in an angora where everybody can meet, yeah? a marketplace for uh, meeting everybody, all the parties can meet. Was it, was it easy? No. There was a lot of discussion about how to relocate and where to put containers. Should they put containers or yeah, what should they do? And they actually put containers uh, on uh, Heldenplatz, yeah, which is a very prominent uh, space uh, in Vienna. And uh, that was the only time when they kind of argued a little bit, but not about the containers, but about the color of the containers. Yeah? Should it be more visible or less visible to the, to the public? Yeah? So what I'm saying here, and you can see there's also, there was also quite a lot of money involved. And for me, it has two more messages. The one was in 2014, when they decided to go ahead, they understood that they might need a buffer. Yeah? So it's not about spending too much. It's about... In the best case, we think we will need this. But can we have 20% more just in case things happen? And things happened. You know, COVID happened. Yeah? And uh, so they needed the 20% uh, percent more, but they were under this 20%. So I think they spent some 17% more. And what you can also see here is that there were different budgets yeah, so there was a budget for the construction and the renovation. There was a budget for the relocation. And in addition, the parliament had some 47 projects going on inside, making the new building attractive, including, um, for instance, spaces uh, for children, for schools to learn democracy to meet up and uh, refurbishing also the library, opening up the library for everybody. So if you now come to Vienna, you can go into the parliament yeah? and you see it and you can visit it. And I think this is uh, not only kind of uh, renovating, but also repositioning democracy in Austria. Yeah? So this is one of the examples I wanted to share with you. Projects contribute to sustainable development. And this is a topic that has been very close to my heart over the last 10, 12 years. And when I started investigating this topic, uh, we did it together with some sustainability experts. And they were always talking political issues. <laughs> Uh, we were talking operations of projects. 
Yeah, so we were talking small and they were talking big. And this is what I found really interesting, how to bring that together, because projects are temporary. And uh, back then, of course, you can also now say there's the UN goals, yeah? And uh, we can, of course, also take the UN's sustainability goals here. But what we did, because we wanted to have it fit to any project type, not only to big infrastructure projects, but also to organizational development projects, we were thinking about uh, the guiding principles of sustainable development. And when I'm talking about sustainable development, what I like is the term development. It's a process. It's a change process. So I'm not sure or I'm convinced that we are not able to kind of reach sustainability, but we can contribute to the sustainable development of a society, of an organization, of a region, you call it. And that makes a difference for me. Yeah? So to consider it as a process and to consider it as a change process also now gets me a little bit beyond KPIs yeah? and more into the direction that uh, people need to change their behavior and need to change their mindset. When we talk about the guiding principles, what you see is, uh, and uh, everybody is familiar here, people, planet, profit. Yeah? I'm just using a little bit different words here. So it's economic, ecologic, and social contribution, impact, benefit, value. Yeah, we need to kind of become more precise with our language here. But uh, for me, what is even more important is the balancing part. Yeah? So balancing economic, ecologic, and social contributions. And with large public projects, we will be able to do that. Yeah? With smaller projects within an organization, if you do an organization development project, you will emphasize more on the social component yeah, and balance it with the economic component. Yeah? Not every project will be able to cover all the dimensions here, but the large projects, the programs, they can. Short, mid and long term orientation. Yeah, this is actually the contradiction I said in projects because projects are by definition short term. Yeah? Actually we want them to be as short as possible. And sustainable development is something that is very long-term oriented. Yeah? And what that helped me to understand even better is that the project as such is just the vehicle. It's the organization. And the contribution is the investment, yeah? the investment case yeah? that is behind. And I think this differentiation uh, has... Uh, more potential to kind of be made clear to everybody and not having a confusion, what is the investment, what is the project, what is the object. Yeah? I think this differentiation might be very useful. Local, regional and global orientation. Not every project will be having an impact globally, yeah? but some can and we just need to be aware of. And of course, the basis is our values, uh, like transparency, traceability, solidarity, yeah? also considering long-term orientation, not only short-term profit, and so on. So when I'm talking about sustainability here, I'm also talking about sustainable project leadership. And I'm not only talking about the sustainability projects, I'm talking about all projects. So there's space in all projects. We just need to find it. And the other differenti differentiation I'm going to make is sustainability on the project. Yeah? So during the building, how are you treating the people, the employees there, for instance, just as one example. And of course, also sustainability by the project. So by the outcome, by whatever you are creating. And of course, the question is always, how do you do it? Yeah? How can you operationalize it? And here, just 
playfully, uh, we developed, um, and this comes from family therapy. It's another case I'm showing to you. Uh, it's a wind park farm. Uh, it's a project in Brazil we could engage with. And uh, this is a systemic board. And uh, as I said, this is coming actually from family therapy. So what I'm inviting is to look outside our normal path and see what is out there and how can we, for instance, in that case, bring in a systemic board for doing a stakeholder analysis. Yeah, so this is actually, uh, as Pretty was saying, I'm a lot engaging with project stakeholders. So this is one of my, my uh, yeah, the things I love to do when I'm doing research. And the other thing what I love to do is actually uh, playing yeah, and kind of see how far I can go. Yeah, so uh, preaching theory and practice by applying and trying out things and experimenting. And uh, you can call it, uh, as a research design, you can call it design research, yeah, if you want to have a proper word for it. Um, and here you can see the systemic board, and we worked with the project manager and two core team members. I'm not going into details here, but just showing you some of the pictures um, what the consequence was. Yeah? So you're all familiar with the stakeholder analysis. And the question is always, as a project manager, as a project leader, so how can we get this topic of sustainability down to earth? And this is one offer for doing so. Yeah? By explicitly integrating sustainability principles in a stakeholder analysis. And uh, I'm also using that one in teaching, um, asking uh, the students to make a stakeholder analysis, just a proper one, yeah? considering take the position of a stakeholder, for instance, the client, looking on the project and saying what the expectations are, and then taking the position of the project, looking at the client, saying what the expectations are, and then making the intervention more or less and saying, okay, is there any social dimension you have considered? Is there any environmental dimension you have considered? Is there any economic dimension you have explicitly considered? And what happens is that you immediately see different things. Is that frightening? Maybe. But what sustainability or including sustainability principles in uh, project management is not making complexity, making projects more complex. Yeah? It just shows the complexity that is there. Yeah? Um, this is frightening because you might not have seen the complexity that comprehensively before. So as project managers, uh, very often you get trained to reduce complexity. And this is necessary because we need plans at the end of the day. But the question is, where is your starting point? Yeah? And how much willingness do you have to embrace the complexity that is there? And from then on, then start reducing and understanding what is necessary. Yeah? And for me, this is, for instance, necessary that you kind of have a comprehensive scope. Yeah? Not only thinking kind of the IT solution or the infrastructure, the building solution, yeah? But as in the example uh, with the renovation project uh, in the parliaments of uh, Austria, uh, also kind of further projects. What is necessary to really make it work? Yeah? What else is necessary? And do we need money for that? Yes, we do. Do we get more benefit for that? Yes, we do. But these are the decisions uh, that I'm offering to uh, kind of open the eyes for and make. We did a stakeholder analysis and what you could see here is that we explicitly considered sustainability principles like economic, ecologic and social. But we were also playing here with is there anything uh, regional or globally yeah, that will kind of make a contribution here. Yeah? There was not so much here. Uh, nowadays, I'm actually more concentrating on uh, 
the first three, the social, uh, environmental, and ecologic perspective. We also kind of continued working with them and did a risk identification based on the stakeholder analysis. And normal kind of the mainstream thinking is we are the project and what is our risk because of these stakeholders. And here we are playing a little bit and say, okay, taking now a stakeholder position and looking at the project and say, okay, what is my project as a neighbor living here next to this project? What is my risk during the project and after the project is finished? Yeah. So again, just kind of broadening uh, our understanding also in the time horizon. Yeah. We're actually looking beyond the project. We're looking, in that case, we're looking at the uh, at this project at the wind park farm and the communities there, they had to make hard decisions. Yeah? One decision was energy now and maybe not being able so easily to build the airport in 10 years or less energy now and keeping this decision open. Yeah? So I think this is valid. I'm not saying the one decision is better or, or worse. I'm, I'm not evaluating the decisions. I'm just saying that we need to have the opportunity to be able to see that far and see what the consequences will be. Companies. Companies. Um, yeah, we have projects in project-oriented companies and project-based companies. So project-based companies are those that kind of deliver projects as for bespoke products. And so we deliver customer projects, yeah? But there's another world. And this other world is actually the internal projects. Renewing the company as such. Organization development projects, strategy projects, also uh, putting a new career path into place. Yeah? So this is very often an uh, overlooked part when you talk <coughs> about projects. And I think this will become more and more important. And uh, this is especially important when we talk about the power of projects and see how they actually renew the organization and create the future for that particular organization. I'm also including the society level here. And uh, there's two terms we need to consider. The first term is projectification. And that is a term that is well established uh, in project management literature coming from uh, Christoph Mittler, 95, yeah, when he was studying Renault and uh, seeing that organizations more and more uh, were using projects. And that has been translated over the years uh, to the society. And we can say in developed countries, it's about one third uh, of the economy is project oriented, about. And for me important here is, it's not kind of that it's necessary to become more project oriented, yeah? So there will be a threshold somewhere. Not everything is a project and should be a project. But so not more projects, but the right project, the right projects. Yeah. So who is making the decision where we invest uh, our money? And the second term is project orientation. And project orientation means on the company level, how good is the company equipped? to do the projects, and now on the society level, how good is the society equipped yeah, and supports projects. And for that, and this is actually the newest research we're doing, is on the project society. And what you see here is, and I'm just putting it up right now, uh, is that we have these four dimensions we are looking into. The one is the human capital, yeah? So kind of uh, 
yeah, uh, the education that is there in the country. Uh, before I say society, I also need to say what society is. Society, you can have any kind of part or it can be a region, it can be a city, it can be a country. Yeah, so this depends how you would like to apply it here. And then we can say, so how good and well educated uh, is other people living there? Yeah, that's the basis. That's actually nothing so new. Uh, this is also how the innovation index is working. Yeah, so people familiar with the innovation index might know that. And based on that, and that's kind of the basis, that's the fundamentals, uh, we look what services does the society offer. Yeah, so how many education programs in project management do they have? Yeah, uh, what, uh, what is going on in project management uh, research yeah? or in project research? Yeah? We can be a little bit broader. It's not only about project management, but in project research. Yeah? Um, are there certification bodies? What kind of certification uh, is there applied? So are there associations promoting uh, the profession? Yeah, here in UK, uh, you are able to uh, get chartered as a project manager. Not in every country you can do that. Yeah? So what difference does that make? Yeah? Is that making a difference to be uh, able to kind of go for the profession project manager or not? Uh, practices, what is applied uh, in which projects are running, yeah? what is applied in society, um, and finally, and this is the new dimension uh, we are uh, adding to, uh, we are trying to simplify that and rather work with proxies uh, in the future because otherwise we will need to have big surveys uh, for every uh, nation and that will not be so easily organizable. So we will be uh, working uh, with uh, kind of the pro proportion of investment, yeah? to see how much projects are going on uh, in practice. And then, uh, and this is the next step, uh, also look into what value is created or what impact is created by the projects. Yeah? And that can be related, and this is the idea here, to the UN goals, yeah? because they are measured in many societies. And of course, uh, a society is always embedded in a context. And uh, the question is like, uh, when we go into more uh, into developing countries, yeah, we will see that uh, there's a lot of agriculture going on there. There might not be currently the need for projects that much. Yeah? So the question is, can we intervene in such societies and bring the possibility of uh, doing projects so they can also further develop themselves? Yeah? So I'm not saying that uh, having a lot of projects and more projects is the best. I'm saying that uh, you need to have the adequate amount of projects that supports the development of the society and at the same time be equipped as a society to do so. Yeah? And if there's a mismatch, yeah, then we probably need more education programs. Yeah? So future kind of giving a little bit of an outlook. Uh, what I'm interested in continuing uh, the topics I was just uh, yeah, sharing with you, but even stronger linking leadership, technology, and sustainability together. Yeah, so I'm a strong believer uh, that technology uh, is an enabler yeah, and we just need to also find how we can use it. And uh, of course, project management with all the tools and methods and practices is there. But for me, this is kind of the basics. Yeah, we know it. And was it, what is needed now is more a project leadership approach. So with projects, we create the future. Let's create the future together. Thank you very much. Martina, just to say thank you so much for your thought-provoking uh, lecture.
And I think uh, you make excellent points, especially because projects are here to stay for the next 40, 50, 100 years beyond our lifespan. So thinking about the value addition of those projects and how they meet the sustainability agenda is vital. So thank you, Martina, for a thought-provoking session. And I'm looking forward to the questions. Okay, if we start from the front, then go to the back, and then I'll start from the side. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Martina. I'm just wondering, the, um, the project spaces um, research that you, you showed earlier, um, do you think that with time that, that space would evolve from those young um, project practitioners that you studied? Uh, and what do you, what do you anticipate for that kind of evolution to, in terms of the space that, they, uh, that you researched on? Mm -hmm. Well, we started with the young uh, project professionals, but actually what we are doing now with the help of IPMA is a, a, a large international survey where we uh, survey all project managers. And uh, I think the spaces are quite stable. Yeah? Uh, I think we all have the need, and this comes from a very established uh, theory, self-determination theory, that you want to be autonomous, that you need relatedness, that you want to be competent. Yeah? I, mean, this is, I think the addition we are making is the purpose. And for me, the purpose is so clear because in projects you see the outcomes. Yeah, so we can we we are much closer to what we are creating. Yeah, and I think this is the strength of projects. And uh, so this is also why I think that uh, also the old established senior project managers they are very very much after the purpose. Yeah, this is why they are motivated to do projects and. Um, it's just anecdotal, but uh, I'm actually using that uh, also as an exercise and have done that uh, over the last uh, months quite often with groups yeah, and just asking the people, so what motiva mot motivates you most? Uh, the younger people, they were more on the learning and the established senior people, they were either on purpose or on relatedness or could not decide. Yeah, but the majority was actually on purpose. And for those that went uh, to relatedness, it was that they were saying, well, I want to have kind of uh, people I love, I love to work together uh, because I have been working so long. Yeah? So I have done my contribution and now I'm just doing it for fun more or less. Yeah? So uh, let's see, but I think the evidence is more the type of project, maybe less the generations, more the type of project. Yeah? So the more concrete projects, like uh, construction projects, I would think the purpose is very much in the foreground. Thank you. Um, so we've got two in the middle row there. Yeah. And then Yolanda at the back, and then I'm going to focus on the side of the room. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, John Pelton, I'm part of the External Advisory Board. Um, uh, Martina, I'm delighted to hear leadership up there in headlights um, for a whole load of reasons that you'll understand. <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask a question, though, about it. Um, th those uh, sectors of society that highly value leadership thinking emergency services, armed forces, uh, invest hugely in both leadership development from the start of the career, but also in the sometimes quite ruthlessly selective process to identify leaders early on. Mm -hmm. I just wonder what your reflections on the, uh, let's call it the infrastructure sector, um, might be in that context. Is that something we, we perhaps should think about now, or, or should we rely on where we are now? Well, I think there's a big difference of being a manager and being a leader. And um, to a certain extent, um, I think you can learn everything. But for some, it's easier. And for others, they need to kind of really go way beyond their comfort zone. Yeah. So I think, uh, especially in construction or in infrastructure more general, um, you have a lot of engineers, and uh, we need engineers. Wonderful. But they might not be the best leaders. 
Some of them are. And on, sm on smaller projects, uh, yeah, you're leading with the content expertise. You're actually leading with their engineering expertise. But as soon as the projects become programs, and the landscape is very varied uh, in stakeholders, and the expectations are very, very contradictory, um, there is the need of uh, really going into a different skill set. So I think I would relate it to the size of the project. And I would also not say that kind of everybody needs to become a project leader. Why? Yeah. I think being an excellent uh, architect, being an excellent uh, engineer, it's great. And what do the project leaders do without them? Yeah? So I think we need both. Yeah? And I don't like this narrative uh, that kind of presses people into a, a career path they're not belonging in. Yeah? So I think we should take a more neutral kind of view on it and see that uh, people can contribute their strength to a project. Thank you. Great stuff. Um, Harvey Mailer from the University of Oxford. Martin, firstly, congratulations on your appointment here. Exciting times for the university and, and for, uh, for us more broadly in the UK uh, project management area. There's, there's a, a, sm a small but uh, uh, group, very, very, very uh, getting closer group again after, uh, after COVID. Um, you mentioned in your talk the, um, the tension about um, sustainable development between the long term goals that, that it presents versus what gets presented in projects, which is much more short term. Mm -hmm. And it just brings about the, the, the thought about the, one of the things we notice about the leaders that we're working with today, they have more trade-offs, more conflicts to deal with than ever before. And what we've just done is add not only this, but a whole ton of other, you know, you, you go through the sustainable development goals and you just get into a point where for some, they are now finding that to be a really not just difficult, but it's almost impossible. And some would say immoral situation we're put, putting them in. Mm -hmm. now, is that something you've, you've observed? And is that, you know, any, any thoughts on that, please? Because I, I think you're right, we're at a turning point. But we can't keep going on saying everybody can be happy all of the time. And uh, that was, you know, that, that was, you mentioned tensions there. But yeah. one of the outcomes of tensions is that some people aren't going to get what they want. Um, and you, you, your work in stakeholders tells us that you know the, you, you have to decide who, whose job it is to be happy. Can you possibly just reflect on that for us, please? I think it's such an important part of where we are today. Yeah, Harvey, thank you. Um, we should not be naive. Yeah. So this is kind of uh, uh, getting uh, what you're saying. Um, I think this is also what I meant. We can uh, thrive. For. Yeah, it's a changing process. Not everybody will get everything all the time. Yeah? And of course, there's also kind of political decisions and power. Yeah? And uh, uh, not uh, acknowledging those yeah, would be naive. However, I, I'm quite happy yeah, if, if people uh, on projects, and for me, project leadership is also shared leadership. So we're not talking about the leader in a big project, yeah, we are talking about a group of leaders. We are talking about uh, also kind of a possibility of them discussing, yeah, not only having one taking over all the responsibility and being the hero, um, but having kind of a shared responsibility here. And uh, then the question is, uh, how do you kind of come to a conclusion? Yeah, and I'm just giving you one example. Um, in, we did uh, in, in Denmark, and we were asked to come in uh, in a, um, it was a, it's, it's the community uh, outside, a community outside uh, Copenhagen, yeah, there's not much, there's only a university and a zoo, and they wanted to have a good strategy on how they could further develop, and they did a wonderful stakeholder engagement, wonderful. Everybody was asked, everybody. But they did not tell the stakeholders what they are taking on and what not. 
And now it was also the time of decision making. And the politicians did not want to make any uh, decision because they were engaging with everybody but forgetting the decision maker. Yeah? So do I say it's easy? No, it's not an easy <laughs> task. Yeah? And that can happen easily. Yeah? It sounds now, yeah, how could they? No, no. Yeah? There was so much kind of trying to be inclusive. Yeah? Uh, that uh, they did not kind of say, this is possible, dear stakeholder, and this is not possible. And this is something that is necessary. So we need to communicate with the stakeholders very clearly what they can get and what they cannot get. That's one part of the answer. And the other part of the answer is, and this is more content related, think about uh, you need to build a new street and uh, think about this, this uh, road, actually it's a country road, and this road, uh, there's possibilities how you can do it. Yeah? The one is actually going through um, an area where there's a very seldom uh, species of frogs, and you would disturb them and destroy them. Or you can take a different route, but that goes by a hospital, and we have statistics that if the noise is going up, then there's a percentage of uh, more people dying in the hospital. Do I want to take this decision? No. Does somebody need to take this decision? Yes. So what I'm saying here is we need to kind of uh, confront ourselves with such decisions and, and, and start being able to uh, talk about it, yeah? And uh, not having it as a taboo or kind of just having somebody else taking the decisions, yeah? Thank you. I think Yolanda in the back. Um, Yolanda Barnes, Professor of Real Estate here at UCL. Um, I'm interested, following on from your point about decision-making, actually, that it's very difficult to make decisions on what you cannot measure. Mm. And I was interested in your project society quadrant of value. And I, I wondered if you'd comment on the fact that it seems to me that whether at local or national level, we're obsessed in um, uh, developed economies with, uh, if you like, the current account or even turnover rather than the balance sheet. We have no way of measuring the value of assets at a national or local level. And it seems to me that that's highly related then to how um, you make decisions around um, projects. And I wondered if you wanted to comment on that. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So I think it's, uh, it, it depends a little bit always on what is the arena yeah, of, of, of your decision. Is it, is it very kind of uh, strict and very, very uh, narrow? Yeah? You will make a different decision. Just think about uh, uh, a train yeah? going between A and B. Um, who is taking care of the investment? Yeah? Is it only A or is there also the necessity of uh, having the other uh, beneficiaries uh, putting something in, understanding that they're actually getting benefit out of it. Yeah? So I think, yes, uh, at the moment, everything that cannot be put into money is overlooked. Yeah? Do I have the solution for it? No, I don't. But I would like to contribute to this discussion and also uh, invite that we are uh, starting to think about solutions. Yeah? Our economic system is uh, very clear, yeah? and this is uh, what we can look when we look into social systems theory. Um, as a researcher, kind of it's publish or perish, either or. Yeah? And in the economic system is money or not money. Yeah. Yeah, both. So, so, no, no. So even if you put it all in money terms, you're still not measuring the value yeah. of all we create. Yeah, I think you cannot put everything in money terms. That's, that's the point. Thank you. 
I think I'm now going to open up conversation and invite questions from this part of the room, yeah? <laughs> which has been very patient. So. I think it's my turn. Uh, thank you so much, Martina, for, for your presentation. Um, funny enough, uh, something that I'm about to ask now has been uh, touched uh, a little bit on your first question. You talk about the purpose of project. We know how projects are important. I wanted uh, also PMJ uh, just had a special issue on uh, project management um, principles. Mm -hmm. yeah? And I was wondering, what are the project management purposes today? The discipline has changed dramatically in the last 20 years. So the purpose that was before, bringing the project on time, on budget, within scope, and with expected quality, is not anymore the purpose that we have today. So what is the new purpose for a project manager? Creating what do you believe? Value? How? You said, what is the purpose? <laughs> <laughs> so creating value for as many stakeholders as possible, not only for the project owner. Yeah? And uh, of course, there's limitations. And how? I mean, uh, kind of doing stakeholder engagement. I mean, I, I did tell how, how it can go wrong, yeah, if you, if you don't get uh, feedback. But your research, like working together with the authorities, Francesco, yeah, this is contributing to value. So I think, I think what uh, the, the old paradigm was uh, project management, yeah, being on time, kind of the typical Iron triangle, being on time, being on cost, yeah, uh, and delivering uh, as much scope as possible, probably, yeah, or being on scope. So what I'm saying here is uh, that the question, and this is why I'm offering these projects as creation spaces. We need to have a, a mind shift, yeah, and this mind shift is, in my opinion, that we create benefits and kind of with these benefits we create value at the end of the day. Yeah. Absolutely. So we need a shift in the organizational culture first. So if we still uh, thinking about making shareholder richer and richer, um, basically bringing them just economic value, um, is 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 a good point for 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 that perspective. Then we face yeah those no new normative way that push us to deliver more. But the organization, they don't want to deliver more because, as we say in economics, yeah, a penny saved is a penny earned. But they don't save any money if they're going to bring more benefit into the economic uh, point of view. So this is the shift of culture that we need. And I think before we deliver value, we should, as a project manager, as you said, uh, shift the culture within the organization that value is not all about economic returns. So it's a hard job, but how long will this take before it will be really effective, before that the client will actually be happy and not the opposite to listen to local communities, delivering extra benefit, go beyond the above stakeholder expectation. Well, I think it depends a little bit uh, in which country we are, yeah? how much is possible and what is not possible. What I learned in Holland, uh, yeah, you have a communication manager on every project and you better engage with the people there, otherwise they will protest and just stop your project. Yeah? So I think this is also kind of uh, situated very much in the, in the culture of the country. But I would not wait yeah, till the culture is changing, now organizational culture is changing. I think the change is us. Yeah? The change is us doing. Yeah? Is that easy? No. But change only comes if we start and not from waiting that there's a cultural shift in any organization. That will not happen. Thank you. I think one last question. Mm. Oh, gosh. I've got the mic. <laughs> okay, I'd like you one. Okay. Uh, Natalia, internal colleague. Uh, my question, uh, thank you, Martina, first for inspiring talk. Um, my question is that 
you said uh, projects are very important vehicles for innovation co-creation. So what are the key drivers for innovation co-creation and how this might change uh, in the future? You mean what are the key drivers now or? More interested perhaps in the future aspect. So what do you think will be key enablers and drivers for innovation co-creation um, in the future? Well, I think uh, the necessity that we need to change, that will be the main driver, yeah? And also the technologies that are available, yeah, at the moment. I think these are, for me, the main drivers. That's great answer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, we do have to draw the formal session to a close, but the fact that we have a flurry of questions show the interest in this topic. Uh, but have no fear, because we do have an informal networking session after this with refreshments. So I'm hoping that uh, you can continue the dialogue and discussion with Martina. Uh, feel free to fire away questions and have a discussion with her after the formal event. And I just wanted to say, Martina, that thank you for reminding us this is the time for change. It's a time for thinking of projects in terms of broader value creation for sustainability of social value. It's time to rethink leadership as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm really grateful uh, for some of the pearls of wisdom you've shared with us today. And as I said, I'm now standing between you and refreshments, so, <laughs> which is very, it's not a great thing to do as a chair. So I would like to invite you to give Martina a round of applause. <laughs>